Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a webinar on behalf of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies Young Neurosurgeons Forum. As the next edition in our webinar series discussing the global burden of neurosurgical diseases to address the need for subspecialty training in regions around the world. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Tony Fuller from the Duke Global Neurosurgery and Neurology Group. Thanks so much for being with us today, Dr. Fuller. Thanks for inviting me. Happy to be here. Um, Dr. Anthony Fuller is the Associate Director of the Division of Global Neurosurgery and Neurology at Duke University where he is an assistant professor of neurosurgery and an affiliate researcher in global health. His research efforts over the past eight years have focused on health system strengthening and development in neurosurgery and neurology in East Africa. Publications from this work cover expanding neurosurgery access, outcome assessments from international partnerships and interventions, and epidemiology research on the burden of surgical diseases and LMICs. His current research interests have included epilepsy in Uganda, where the focus is on health system strengthening using a multifaceted research approach using epidemiology, health facility-based, and community belief research for intervention and advocacy development. These research efforts are in partnerships with multiple public health and uh, health sciences colleges in Uganda, Ugandan government bodies, and other partners in Uganda, including neurologists, psychologists, and healthcare workers. Um, to start us off this morning, we'll have a few quick questions before we get to the meat of the topic. Uh, so just an easy one, Dr. Fuller, can you tell us a little bit about your path to your current position and how you got interested in becoming uh, such a strong global neurosurgery and neurology advocate? Yeah, definitely. So for me, a passion for global health has always been there since I was an undergrad. I always had a kind of a global perspective on health, um, given sort of my upbringing and background. And so when I continued on my journey to undergraduate medical school, I knew that it was an important part of what I wanted to do. So actually, some people come into medical school not really knowing what they wanted. I knew on day one that what my plan was, was to try to combine global health and neurosurgery. And so I began my first year, first week of medical school, actually, working with uh, Dr. Michael Haglin, who is the division chief for DGNN. And kind of the story goes from there, <laughs> more or less, where we were able to do work from that first year. And during my time in medical school at Duke, you have the opportunity to do other degrees during your research time. And so I took time and did the Master of Science in Global Health program, which is a two-year program, which allowed me to do research in Uganda, um, which really sort of catapulted me to the spot now. I lived in Uganda for seven months and more or less every year since then, I've lived in Uganda anywhere between three to six months every single year besides this year, although I was in Uganda at the beginning of this year um, a few times. And so for me, that's brought me to the spot, but also I have a kind of a unique decision. I really love this work and I really was kind of making a tough decision after I graduated from medical school about going on to residency, which had always been kind of the key thing in my mind or coming on as faculty and helping to sort of lead this division, which is what I currently do. And so I made that decision to go come on as faculty. And so I'm purely on the research and advocacy side of things, um, both from an epidemiology perspective and then from kind of a multifaceted sort of mixed methods approach from research. It's given me a lot of flexibility to live in Uganda, as I said, and work closely with our partners as well as work closely um, with our sort of all of the partners and government as well as our sort of healthcare providers. So it's really been, a unique path, but I love exact. I love what I get a chance to do uh, every single day. Well, that's so cool. Um, I know you have a, a very unique story in, in deciding not to go to residency uh, kind of later on in life. So I think it worked out worked out nicely. Um, a little bit about the epilepsy and and functional diseases. So I know DGNN has a pretty strong focus in epilepsy and advocating for treatment and, and kind of a cohesive approach to epilepsy and functional disease. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you guys got interested in that particular area of neurosurgery um, and neurology? I know it's a complex area and you need to include other partners, unlike other um, focuses of neurosurgery. It could be a little easier to implement without needing to include psychologists and neurologists and do kind of the, the community training as well. Definitely. So I would say that when we first started, I think as most global neurosurgery programs, 
like at the top of your list is traumatic injuries. And so a lot like 70 plus percent of the caseload in Uganda um, and many, you know, low and middle income countries is traumatic brain injury cases or trauma cases. And so things that are tumors and epilepsy become operations that aren't actually performed all that often. But what we were seeing, especially from talking to our neurology partners on the ground, is that and when they're when they're going to their clinics, their neurology clinics, they were seeing a lot of epilepsy patients. And so for us, it began to sort of spark some discussions about how do we kind of help to kind of examine what that would look like in terms of epilepsy burden and how to manage it. And then also, how do we build into our current training um, mechanism in Uganda to bring epilepsy surgery into that? And so that really sort of sparked our interest and the desire to do this work. And over the past three or four years, we've been kind of slowly building up to understanding how do you put an entire kind of team together? Because as you said, epilepsy care requires you to have a lot of different people involved that can do the you know initial intake, can understand how to um, assess the, neuro the epilepsy patients. And then picking good surgical candidates as all surgeries is important, but in epilepsy surgery, it's as one of the most important things for ensuring that the surgery is going to be effective. And so you need good neurology care. You need good specialists who are able to do the EEGs and interpret them. And you need the necessary diagnostics in order to take someone um, to surgery or for it to be able to be effective. And so that really sparked us. And so we've always in our group had this idea of health system strengthening. And so looking at a, looking at a particular disease, but then looking at everything around it and what's important. And I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of some of those things in the presentation today, but the necessity of looking at the health system and how things are set up and also how the community interacts with epilepsy is important mm -hmm. because the stigma and all of these things that create barriers to care lead you to not being able to actually treat the patients who would actually benefit from these things. And so having that broader lens helps you to think about how do you create, you know, innovative solutions to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's a perfect transition into the, the heart of the topic here. So I'll turn over the screen to you if you have uh, slides to share. And if not, we'll just let you let you talk. Definitely. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, in a second. It says that uh, I'm not able to share. Interesting. Uh, I wonder why. says that host disabled participant screen share. Allow. Okay, how about now? There we go. Perfect. It's gotta make sure y'all are on my screen. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So perfect. So again, I'm really excited to be talking with everyone today and, you know, recording for those of you who are not here. And so getting a chance to talk about sort of the epidemiology of epilepsy and really how can we look at this um, and how do we address this burden uh, across the world? And so what I want to do, and I think it's incredibly important to me in terms of, in, oops, in terms of collaborations is to is to just start off with the fact that this, I'm the person talking today, but it's been such a collaborative effort from the start. Um, and it's so important to highlight to the people who have done all the work and who are continuing to take care of these patients um, across the world. And so just wanting to highlight a couple of the you know key people here. So in the top left, we have our kind of team that we've built up in terms of collaborations of we really try to understand who are the people in Uganda who are taking care of these neurology patients. And so in many low and middle income countries, neuro epilepsy patients are actually taken care of both by neurologists, if there are some, but then also by psychologists and psychiatrists. And so from that standpoint, we began to talk to that entire spectrum and built a team of neurologists, psychiatrists, and uh, psychologists who are taking care of these patients. And so this is just a few of those folks. In the top right is actually the neurosurgery team. And this is the entire neurosurgery team at Embarara Regional Referral Hospital, um, which is in the western portion of the country. And these are the, pe these are the people who actually really take care of those um, epilepsy patients. And 
although they don't do a lot of epilepsy surgery there, these are the folks who will one day be able to take care of those patients. In the bottom left is one of the most exciting things for us, which is earlier, about a year or so ago, we were actually able to establish at Embarara the first epilepsy clinic that's purely dedicated to epilepsy patients. And this was a collaboration between our group, a bunch of the folks uh, in Embarara and the neurologists. But then additionally, there's people, this is the head of the hospital in Embarara, and this is the mayor of the area of Embarara. And so it really was this collaborative effort to open up this clinic, which has now seen 300 patients a year that are both adult and pediatric, that are purely epilepsy patients, which is allowing us to be able to take care of those patients, screen them, and then at some point very soon be able to, you know, pick out the best surgical candidates and be able to operate on those patients. And then this is just one of the other exciting parts is that we have folks on our team that do community outreach. And so this is Gerald, who is one of the people who worked at this clinic, and he's able to go out into the communities and be able to talk to the epilepsy patients and be able to bring them to the clinic. And here he's given an interview in the local language that talks about the opening of this clinic and saying that here you can get treated for epilepsy and there's medications that are available. All of these things are important to what I'll talk about later of how do you actually kind of get to this spot. And so the next part of that is that there's a lot of partners. And again, just wanting to highlight them. So we have our Ugandan team. We have our team here at Duke. And then we have a whole bunch of people, students from the spectrum of, you know, undergraduate students, medical students, and residents who have worked on this effort. And so everything that I'm going to share with you today is based upon this, like, collaborative nature to trying to address this sort of broader overall topic. So with that, what we're going to really dive into today is we're going to try to talk about the epilepsy sort of epidemiology and sort of understanding what is the true impact of epilepsy around the globe. Asking ourselves, what is the role for neurosurgery, especially in low and middle income countries, with the idea that we just spoke about a little bit earlier of the fact that in many of these places, the largest burden of disease is traumatic. And so how do you build up the ability to take care of epilepsy patients, which requires a lot of different facets that trauma care doesn't, which it has some higher level of health system sort of integration and strengthening that's necessary. And then lastly, there's lots of efforts. And I wanna be clear that today, I'm not gonna be able to talk about all of them, but I am gonna highlight the work that we do here um, in Uganda, just to give an example of some of the things that are going on to try to build up the epilepsy um, capacity for care. So what is the impact of epilepsy globally? And I'm gonna present some of this, which I'm sure some of you know, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. So when you look at, when you just look at the global burden of disease and you specifically look at DALIs, neurological dis disorders themselves has increased over time, moving from 15th to the top 10. And so within neurological diseases, and disorders, there's a whole bunch of things there. Epilepsy is just one of them. Stroke is obviously another one um, that's really high up on the list. And so you do have this shift of what is what are causing sort of this global disease burden and neurological disorders are heading into the top 10 and are in the top 10 currently. Then you look at what is causing the disability for, for people around the globe. And this is where you're able to see that idiopathic epilepsy itself actually has shifted from 14th to, again, being in the top 10. And so when you look at the years of life lost to disability, you see that idiopathic epilepsy is actually increasing in terms of its overall contribution. And one of the most important things when you look at this list is that it's actually shifted 41% over the course of this time. And so it's one of those disease processes that has pretty rapidly gotten into the top 10. There's a whole slew of reasons for that. Um, and it's complex statistical reasons for that, but under, this is clear to show that epilepsy is something that's important at the global level for us to think about, and especially when we're trying to build up capacity in neurosurgery and neurology uh, across the world. Then you look at the epilepsy prevalence um, across the world to just get a sense of where is the disproportionate burden. And unfortunately, there's so many maps that look this way but this is just one of the same things that you see is that epilepsy as a kind of a burden of disease 
is very high in Sub-Saharan Africa and other low and middle income country places. And some of the drivers for this, which I'm sure people are aware of, some of the drivers for this actually do have to do with health system and how patients are getting taken care of. And this is also where you begin to kind of pull in a lot of the different things that are part of sustainable development goals. So what can be contributors to epilepsy? You can have antenatal problems that are causing you know, babies to be born and that leads them to have an epilepsy. You have infectious disease issues that can be causing people to then get epilepsy. You have traumatic problems that can cause people to get epilepsy. And so you can see how you have this like unique combination of these different factors where in these locations, you have differential sort of maternal and sort of neonatal care, which can lead to a greater preponderance of epilepsy. You have higher rates of infectious disease, sort of such as onchocerciasis and schistosomiasis and other things that are parasitic illnesses that can lead to epilepsy that are just higher in these areas. And then you also have the higher rate of trauma that also occurs. And so post-traumatic epilepsy is another thing. So you can see all these things kind of coming together, which are driving up the sort of rates of epilepsy in these areas. And so you look at that and say, okay, what is the impact of epilepsy? So when you look at this from the broad level, there's about 50 million people um, around the world living with epilepsy. And of those 50 million, 80% of those are living in low and middle income countries. And so that's already a stark you know, contrast in terms of where the patients are living. Most importantly, when you look at that 80%, there's now this also very large treatment gap for taking care of those patients. And so you have 75% of those patients who have epilepsy are not able to receive treatment. And now you get into a bunch of those other factors that were brought up earlier where there's lots of different causes. You don't have the staff that's necessary to care with them. There may be differential access to the anti-epileptic medications that you need. There is a large contribution of stigma related to epilepsy and those that drives people to not seek care. Um, and then you have kind of all these other things in terms of how epilepsy is, is seen in terms of a health system. Again, going back to what I was just talking about, in many low income countries, epilepsy is seen as a mental health condition. And that creates, it, it creates a dynamic in terms, in terms of how it's cared for in the health system which also creates an ability for further stigmatization when people think it's a mental health problem and not seeing directly that it's like a neurological sort of basis fundamentally that's causing that person to have epilepsy. It can cause some misconceptions both within sort of the general community, but even within healthcare workers that are caring for epilepsy patients. You still see some of these kind of stigmatizing beliefs even in healthcare providers. And all of this is causing sort of a greater risk of those people who have epilepsy dying. Um, all important things for us to consider in terms of the impact of epilepsy. Now, epilepsy is not a single thing. Epilepsy is a very sort of multifaceted condition. There's multiple different types. And so this is also an important factor for us, especially when we're thinking about it in terms of care, but also from a neurosurgical perspective is that you have focal onset epilepsy, you have these general onset and unknown onset, all of these different things are different categorizations of epilepsy. And this is just one of the classification, one of the newer ones from the International League of Against Epilepsy. So you see that there's just a wide spectrum. And additionally, there's a wide spectrum of etiologies that are causing these different types of conditions and these different types of epilepsy and seizures. And so, all of this is what needs to be taken into consideration when you're trying to think about, you know, doing something to treat um, people that have epilepsy. So what is the role? And is there a role for neurosurgery in terms of taking care of these epilepsy patients? And I'm sure everyone is here because you believe that the answer is yes. And so let's talk about why that's the case. So let's take a newly diagnosed epilepsy patient and just take through sort of the general spectrum of how we would care for them. So the first line when someone has a seizure or someone has epilepsy is certainly going to be anti-eleptic medications. And so let's just see how we take care of them kind of throughout and what, what's happening. So you take that first seizure medication. Of that population, 47% of those may, you know, respond to that medication and become seizure-free or have seizure reduction that allows them to 
you know, stay on that medication and be okay. 53% of those are going to end up having uncontrolled seizures still, which is going to require you to think about adding on another medication. Importantly here, especially when it comes to sort of low income countries, some of the issues that you run into are like being able to have a full test of that first anti epileptic drug, meaning if there's drug stockouts or not enough supplies, people don't have like a true first pass at their anti-seizure medication, which can also lead to poor control. So this is there, these numbers have wide confidence intervals depending upon where you're at in the world and what treatment is available. Uh, and so that's just another important consideration here. But then you move on and you, you give that person another anti-seizure medication. Of those 53%, 13% again are going to be able to be seizure free or have seizure reduction. And then the other part, the other 40 are still going to have uncontrolled seizures. So you still have this group of patients who have uncontrolled seizures. Then you, if you're going to continue on the medical pathway, you may add another medication. And you see here that there's a, a, a further drop off of the efficacy of adding more and more medications. Now, some patients will respond to a third medication, but you still have this large group of uncontrolled seizures. And so here the question is, what do we do about those patients who have uncontrolled seizures and medications don't sort of help them? And the answer certainly, and the answer for us is certainly surgery is an option. There's other things out there, ketogenic, ketogenic diet, other things that can be used for management of seizures in tandem with medication that allows some of those folks to have seizure control. But this is the role for surgery where medications don't work, and now you are able to assess this patient to see if they're a good surgical candidate. So the answer is straightforward, yes. There's a definitive role for neurosurgery in this area. And of those patients who are good surgical candidates, you can have high rates of surgical like effectiveness for those patients, hovering in the high 70, 90% of having a good surgical candidate doing a good operation, and then that patient being able to be seizure-free, not just in the short term, but also 10-year seizure freedom. And what's most important for us is that we need to have a full evaluation. And this is just one of the examples of kind of how you would go through this pathway to understand what role does neurosurgery have and what operation may be most effective um, for that individual patient. And so given that this isn't the surgical side of treatment is not my specialty. Understanding the role and figuring out how do we improve that is sort of my specialty. But I just wanted to add this here that this is just an example of how you could sort of assess the patient and what are the most appropriate um, sort of care pathways for them. So we've established that there's a role for neurosurgery. And so what does that mean in the broader sense? And so again, then we have to take a step back and understand how can neurosurgeons actually take care of epilepsy patients? So yes, there's a role, but then you run into these other challenges. And one of the first challenges you run into is gonna be the workforce. And so everyone here I'm sure is aware of this. Uh, and so similar to the map before, you look at the workforce shortages across the world. And so you see in that same area that epilepsy prevalence is highest, and therefore there's probably a large, there is, a large number of epilepsy patients, you have a workforce shortage in the neurosurgery side to be able to care for those patients. And so this map is showing kind of that same thing here. Now take that a little bit further and be able to and be able to think about, okay, so with that deficit of neurosurgeons, what does it look like in terms of case volume that they're able to operate on? And again, this is where you get into some of the numbers that seem impossible to meet, especially in the short term, where you look at the number of cases that need to be performed. Importantly to note for this study, epilepsy was included as one of the 10 primary conditions that contributed to this case volume. So epilepsy was considered one of the 10 essential types of surgery that need to be performed across the world. And so it's contributing to this case volume. How much? We need to dive into and tease into the numbers a little bit, but this case volume is driven by, some of the case volume is driven by epilepsy. So you see this case deficit of almost, you know, 1.9 million cases, and then you need 8,000 more neurosurgeons to actually address that. Going back to what I just said, you know, a, a while ago, again, most of those, most of these surgeons who are taking care of patients, 
70% of their operative load is on traumatic cases. And then that other 30% is all of the other kind of uh, other operations that are available. And how do you, one, train in an environment where you don't see a lot of epilepsy cases and you don't perform them? So how do you build up the capacity to take care of epilepsy cases in that setting where even the surgeons who have been trained, they just haven't seen and take, taken care of a lot of epilepsy cases. So even with the training paradigm of bringing up and creating programs in country to train neurosurgeons, there's still the a lack of being able to have that education to train them to care for epilepsy patients. And so there's all of these kind of things that are coming together in addition to the other barriers of sort of that epilepsy patients encounter in terms of receiving care that I talked about before. But this is on the neurosurgery side, one thing that's important for us to consider. So you may think, okay, with all of that, is it possible to do epilepsy surgery in the global context? And I just want to say the resounding statement is yes, 100%, no doubt about it, we can do epilepsy surgery and we can do epilepsy surgery well. And so again, there are a whole bunch of examples of this, Uganda, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, you know, there, and I'm, I'm not going to, hopefully I'm not excluding anyone, but there's plenty of other examples of epilepsy surgery programs and epilepsy surgery being performed, performed well and having good treatment outcomes for those patients. What I am going to show is one example from Uganda, which actually, this wasn't 2019, this wasn't this year, this was 2009, where this, where this was epilepsy surgery. And this is just an example of what happened. So they had a cohort of 10, they, had, they were doing epilepsy surgery at Cure Hospital, which is in Mbale, which is in the sort of Eastern portion of the country. And they were able to do epilepsy surgery on 10 cases during that time. And they've continued to do epilepsy surgery since then. What this shows here is that one, they did the surgery, they had good surgical candidates, and when you look at the last part, which is outcome, they had a, a majority of these patients had seizure freedom and they had a good recovery after the surgery. And so this obviously shows again, resoundingly, yes, epilepsy surgery can be performed and yes, it can be performed well with the ability to have sort of seizure freedom. And importantly from this, they did a follow-up study which looked at 10 year outcomes. So again, this was in 2009, they did 10-year outcomes, and 75% of those patients still remain seizure-free after. And so it was effective in the short term, and it's been effective in the long term for those patients. And they did a comparison of those pa this patient cohort to a matched cohort that were medically treated and showed that the seizure freedom and sort of quality of life and other stigma that goes around that was all reduced um, in this cohort. Again, so not only was surgery effective at controlling the seizures, it also improved that patient's quality of life and also helped to reduce the stigma that that individual encountered sort of afterwards. And so all of this is just saying, resoundingly, yes, we can do surgery. So now we get to the question, we know that we can. So how do we actually do this? And what are some of the current efforts? So as I said at the beginning, I... I'm very well aware of all the amazing efforts around the world to address this. And I'm purely going to talk about ours in Uganda, just because I have the most intimate knowledge. So I can share some of our experiences. And I think there's some important perspectives and lessons that we've picked up through this that can be applied in, in many different ways to the other efforts that exist and also new efforts um, that may be on the way. So I'm not able to see the chat, but if there's questions, I have no problem with pausing and, and addressing those. Um, the uh, question says, interesting that surgery was done without MRI. Uh, was the cohort mainly space occupying lesions or how did you identify the lesions in this in this cohort? Yeah, so so that's that's very true. So I I, I would need to go back to the study, but I'm pretty sure that they just use EEG and CT imaging for this patient cohort. Um, I didn't address this earlier, but obviously MRIs are not readily available um, kind of in many low and middle income country settings. And so again, surgical beginning to pick the best surgical candidate is going to be reliant on using some of these other modalities and pulling them together until 
the availability of MRIs is more substantial. Even CT imaging in a place like Uganda um, is still not readily available across the country. Greater than 75% of all the regional level facilities and higher in the country don't have readily, don't have a CT in their facility. They may have access in the surrounding areas and private um, entities that have CT, but the facilities themselves do not have CTs. And so this is just another part of the spectrum of, again, how do we begin to think about surgical candidacy in low and income country settings if you don't have access to all the things that you would normally do to assess an epilepsy patient? And I think here, again, they were able to show that they're able to do this well and you know provide seizure freedom for the, these patients. And I, uh, here you see that some of them did have specific lesions and other ones didn't, but they're able to identify it compared with the EEG and then the operation that they performed was able to address that. Now, again, going back to what we talked about a little bit earlier, the types of how we choose the best surgical candidate and the best surgical approach is not in my current purview, but it is something that sort of how do we assess those patients? This type of assessment is clearly possible and led to you know good seizure uh, management for these patients in addition to improvements in their quality of life. So moving, moving back to the current efforts. So what I want to address, uh, again, just going back to at the immediate start of my presentation was the idea that all of these kind of work requires you to think about the entire health system and also requires you to partner with everyone that you possibly can um, in order to begin to address these things, because these are large questions and large problems. And so for us, what we've done over the course of the past four years in terms of epilepsy space is begin to partner with, again, as many people as possible. So we've partnered, we've had a partnership in Uganda with the neurosurgeons since 2009. Um, and more recently, given their numbers going up, they were able to establish the Neurosurgical Society of Uganda. So we partnered with them. We partnered with all of the major universities in the country. So Makerere University, um, the different sort of different uh, schools within Makerere, um, Budabika National Referral Mental Hospital, which is actually the primary referral center in the country. And again, going back to where is epilepsy treated, most of the epilepsy patients are still treated in mental health hospitals. And so they still see, again, a large number of the epilepsy patients in Barar and Western Uganda, Malago and Central Uganda. And then also for a lot of this work, we need to look at the large scale burden and so we also partner with the Uganda Bureau of Statistics, which is the entity in the country that does a lot of the national level assessments. So we begin to think about sort of when you look at this problem, you also need to look at what are, where's the, the disease burden across the country in order to be more strategic in terms of how do you set up training facilities and training programs in the areas that have the highest need. In addition to that, it's important to not only focus on the clinical side, it's important to focus on the community engagement side. And so for us, we've partnered again with two other entities, Purple Bench Initiative, which is actually a stigmatization reduction um, kind of program that goes out into local schools and talks about epilepsy with kids in Uganda and is run by someone who she personally has epilepsy and she's able to talk to the kids about her experience and also destigmatize this, which has also led to a lot of benefits. And then you have the Epilepsy Society of Uganda which has kind of community groups across the entire country, again, to work on this community sensitization. You can't get people to care if they still have stigmatizing beliefs uh, around epilepsy. And then of course, you can't do any of this work without funds. And so being able to work together in collaboration um, to go after different funding mechanisms. So all of this has really helped us to build up our partnership in the country. So what, what did we start off with? So one of our first questions, especially linking back to um, what we saw at the beginning of this presentation, we wanted to understand what is the actual prevalence of epilepsy in Uganda at a national level, but we also wanted to understand what was the distribution in terms of all the smaller regions and districts in the country. So again, we could understand where is the burden, where are the hospital facilities that can care for those patients and be able to look at that and create a map to understand what is the accessibility and where 
are the most important places we begin to train. The next part is in the country, how is epilepsy managed? So what is the current sort of management guidelines that are used? How often are any of those patients going to surgery? What is the sort of medication availability usage? All of those things. The second part, sorry, the third part was then understanding what are the beliefs around epilepsy? And not just beliefs in the community, but also beliefs in the healthcare system. So talking to healthcare providers to also get their sense of when they think about epilepsy patients, how do they conceptualize treating those patients? And also what are their belief systems as well? And then the, the last, so again, that goes also, the, the last two things go together, uh, epilepsy beliefs in the, in the sort of broader community, but then also epilepsy beliefs in the providers. Um, then we also said you, you have to train the other people. If you're going to create good surgical candidates, you need good neurology care. You need good initial assessment. You need an ability to have someone who can actually run an EEG and interpret it. And then you need an ability to have communication between those neurologists and the neurosurgery departments in order to select the best candidates. And so for us, that really focused on, we've already been, for any of you who know about Duke Global Neurosurgery and Neurology and our partnership in Uganda, we've been working for years since you know 2009, um, building up the neurosurgery capacity in the country. And so there we already have a bunch of neurosurgeon and a bunch of that on the neurology side, that's where we really needed the focus for this epilepsy effort. So we began saying, okay, we need to be able to build and train up the neurologist to take care of epilepsy patients. We need to find a way to connect them to so we can have some epileptologist in the country or have some experience where they can actually do the interpretation of those EEGs. You need to have technicians who know how to do EEGs well and effectively, and you need some specialized nursing care. And then for us, the last part was to work with our partners to establish these centers of excellence, because before some of our work, these places had epilepsy embedded within neuro their neurology clinics. Despite the great need to have epilepsy patients have their own specialized clinic, there wasn't one that really existed in many of these uh, locations. So we wanted to partner with them to start building epilepsy centers of excellence. So what has been some of our progress to date? Um, and so for answering that first question, we did a nationally representative sample, again, working with a bunch of partners and working again with Uganda Bureau of Statistics. We were able to assess across the country 35,000 um, people with a household survey that screened them and then also uh, brought those patients to the clinic to confirm which of those people actually had epilepsy. We did a hospital-based management study where we followed a cohort of 600 um, patients who were being cared for epilepsy in th the three main um, hospitals in the country. We, in addition to that national prevalence study, we talked to the community and we were able to ask 15,000 people across the entire country about their belief systems around epilepsy, what barriers they encounter when they try to access epilepsy care, and then what are the drivers of the causes of epilepsy from their beliefs. And then the last part was focus groups where we talked to healthcare providers we talked to not only the biomedical healthcare providers, we talked to traditional healers who also take care of epilepsy patients in these settings. And we talked to pastoral healers who also take care of epilepsy patients to get a broad sense of how do everyone from the community through every type of provider who cares for epilepsy patients think about epilepsy care. And so I'm gonna to touch on this part just a little bit because it gets out what I was speaking uh, about earlier. So. On the, on the left side here, our first screen was just to understand if someone more or less has had a seizure during their lifetime. And so this first part really gave us a sense of what is the seizure prevalence across the country? And this is a little bit small possibly for some people, but in these dark blue areas, that's higher than 10% prevalence in the sample. Um, and so you can see that there are these broad areas across the country where, and it's pretty much spread, across the country in different areas that there are greater than, you know, 10% uh, prevalence of epilepsy, sorry, of seizure in that area. We follow that up with trying to confirm which of those actually had multiple seizures. And so we tried to be more specific with our tool. That brought it down a little bit, but there's still, you see these pockets spread across the country where even with that, these dark green, sorry, these dark blue areas um, still are, have greater than 10% of epilepsy. And in those areas across the country, that these these people 
have epilepsy. And so trying to understand the etiology is what we're currently working on, but then also trying to understand what is the ability for these patients to access care. For those of you who under know Uganda, luckily this spot right here is pretty close to Mbale. This spot here is close to Kampala so that people could go to Malago. This spot here is relatively close to Embarara. This spot here is close to Gulu Regional Referral Hospital, which currently doesn't have the full capacity to treat epilepsy patients. So many of these places, these patients here um, have a lack of access to care. So again, for us, that helps to highlight, okay, Gulu Regional Referral Hospital is one of the places we can begin to work with to build up capacity. Then we were looking at sort of the spectrum and here looking at what is the spread of epilepsy in terms of sort of the different uh, age groups. And what you can see is kind of this transition and there's still you know, large numbers of epilepsy um, patients as you get into the older age groups, but it's mainly centered around sort of this middle, you know, five to 35 age range where majority of the epilepsy um, prevalence exists in Uganda. So the other part then for progress, because I didn't want to, I could share results with you all day <laughs> about our, the other parts of the research, but that part was important in terms of sort of the prevalence of epilepsy. Having that kind of map allows you to lay on the different healthcare centers, look at how long does it take people to get to care, given that we have like a lot of the GPS information that allows us to see how long would it take. We ask people about their barriers and we can overlay all of those as we're working with our partners and working with the Ministry of Health to think about how do we begin to improve sort of access and where are the best strategic spots. The next part is then obviously building up the capacity in the country for being able to care for those patients. And so we've been able to train some neurologists. We haven't yet at the moment trained any epileptologists, but that takes some time. And then additionally, what we've done though is partner with some of our team here at Duke to help with reading some of those difficult EEGs. Um, we've trained EEG technicians as well as specialized nurses. All of this led to, again, what I said at the very beginning, one of the most important and amazing things for us, which is the establishment of the epilepsy clinic in Ambarara um, about a year ago. And so the two neurologists that helped, that were trained went back and now were able to lead this clinic. So one adult and one pediatric. And they have been leading this clinic with two physicians, um, one EEG tech, one community um, outreach person, uh, a skilled nurse, and then a, a person who does some of the data entry to be able to ensure that we're tracking what's happening in the clinic in terms of like medication usage, et cetera. And this is just an example of them kind of working and testing, putting leads on um, and running the EEG because this is a little EEG room. So you have this amazing three more or less three room suite that has taken care of 350 to 400 patients throughout the year um, in Uganda with that for epilepsy. And ever since it's opened, it's continued to have, you know, 20 to 40 patients every clinic day coming. So there's been this reduction and some of the stigma. And now it's kind of that if you open it, they will come. And we opened this clinic and all of these people have now been coming and receiving care. And most importantly, we've been able to follow them up. We've been able to have people come back um, and maintain on epilepsy medication, which is now going to be the next part of us being able to see what is the effectiveness of the current management and being able to identify what are those patients who actually are refractory who would be best surgical candidates as we begin to build up the training in our surgical space. So going back to kind of establishment of these epilepsy centers, so what we currently have is all of these green places are, are locations where there is a significant number of neurosurgeons who have the capacity to care for epilepsy surgery patients. If we, as we begin to continue to expand our training and capacity to care for epilepsy in those areas. So you have these three locations and then this location is red because they've already done epilepsy surgery. And so in Embarar, sorry, in Embale, um, this is where the Cure Hospital is. And so Cure Hospital, as was that study that I referenced earlier, who's already been taking care of epilepsy patients. And then as I pointed out earlier, Gulu, um, which is here, doesn't have, we have some, we've worked with them, but we haven't been able to fully establish neurosurgery care there. So what's our plan? 
our plan is to do this, which is to build up epilepsy centers of excellence, which has the neurological sort of capacity to assess, provide medication and management for patients, but then also is linked to a neurosurgery department where they begin to talk about these patients and have collaborative kind of rounds where they're talking about what is the management and how they're taking care of those patients so we can begin to um, do surgery. The other part, though, which is a little bit more important to us in the general scheme is that these are just four locations, but there's a whole slew of hospitals and healthcare center fours across the country. And an important part of what we found from our healthcare provider study is that these are actually, these healthcare center fours have a, have a great utility for taking care of epilepsy patients. Every time you need a medication refill, you shouldn't need to go back to the referral hospital. You should be able to go to your healthcare center four, which is closer to you. And you should be able to have providers there that know how to assess epilepsy, understand how to prescribe medication and know how to look for adverse effects. And then if they need to, to then refer those patients up to the regional referral center. And so what we're also doing in tandem with the other work is being able to work with our collaborators to develop an education platform to increase the number of, of providers at these healthcare center fours who can actually assess and manage those epilepsy patients. So you can create this referral system that allows you to have the you know, full assessment at the re referral centers, place those patients on medication, maintain them on medication during at the health care center fours, and then refer back up those patients who are refractory. And then again, once they're there at the referral center, be able to work in tandem with the neurosurgery units to be able to provide care for those patients who would be the best surgical candidates. So some just key takeaways um, that I wanted to leave you all with and then open to questions is that epilepsy itself is a pretty prevalent condition and contributes you know, significantly to the burden um, around the world, especially from a morbidity standpoint. Epilepsy can be managed effectively, and there definitely is a role for neurosurgery in this space. The barriers that exist in terms of that management are a whole slew of things, and the biggest one, as we talked about, is workforce shortages, but that workforce shortage also leads to uh, an impact on the training capacity for epilepsy care. And then also with wrapped up in all of this is the stigma. If we can't begin to reduce some of the stigma, those patients that have epilepsy are never going to make it to the hospital to begin with. And so it kind of has this like holistic um, perspective in terms of how do you, you know, how do you reduce stigma in a broader sense to be able to drive more people to clinics, which then allows them to be treated effectively. And so it's kind of that whole way to think about this. And then the other part is that it's clearly possible to do epilepsy surgery effectively in low income countries, but it does require us to think about different ways of coming up with kind of a guidelines for assessment, for guidelines for management. If you don't have an MRI, how do you pick the best surgical candidates? And being able to have a way to share that knowledge with other places so that you begin to care for those patients um, effectively, and then be able to build that into our current training program, given that epilepsy surgery is such an important thing and has such good outcomes for those patients. We need to begin to build epilepsy surgery into um, our training programs that we currently have. And then the last part is that I, I feel this in my heart for everything that I do, and it's probably the most important part is that none of this work is possible without having you know really strong collaborations with all the key um, um, people in the country, but then also have a mindset for health system strengthening. We're trying to think about the entire health system approach, not just a singular disease process, but how does that begin to fit into what are the necessities for building out the rest of the system so that we can begin to work in tandem, not just with epilepsy, not just with neurosurgery, but with the surgery departments, with the maternal and fetal health departments, all of these things that in many ways contribute to the best care for you know epilepsy patients when you look at it from that holistic standpoint. So with that, those are the key takeaways. I I'm open to answering any questions. So thanks for everyone for who's here for listening and for those who are listening to the recording. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Fuller, for a great presentation. Um, if anyone in the audience has questions, I can unmute you and uh, or you can chat if you prefer. Um, I guess I'll get us started while people are are either raising their hands or typing in questions. Um, but how 
How have you seen some of the best approaches to addressing that stigma that might be present to, to um, try to start to treat epilepsy patients? And, um, you know, what would you say to, to surgeons here or healthcare professionals here who might be interested in starting a center of excellence like you are, but are afraid that they're not going to be able to find their patients? Yeah, so this is a multifaceted um, question. So what I'll begin with is that the, the first step is that one of the important things that drives some of the stigma is the is the inability to like have good kind of management in the hospitals, which is which is related to some of the medication problems. So uh, and it's it's a strange thing to think about, but what ends up happening is like a, a driver of the stigma. You have epilepsy, you already have a stigmatization that medication and sort of biomedicine isn't going to work. You go into a hospital, you can't, you're not placed on the, you're not given the right dosage for the full amount of time, have a full test of your sort of epilepsy medication. You then don't have good seizure control, which drives your belief system that, okay, this doesn't work. And, it, and then you go back to your community or the other people that you're with and tell them that this didn't work. And so one of the main things is being able to work in the, in the health system to ensure that you have effective management availability so that the patients who do come get good care to drive a reduction in the overall stigma. If you, you continue to have people go to biomedicine and they don't have effective management, either medically or surgically, they're going to go back and still have you know seizure seizures, which is going to lead them to continue with the stigmatization circle. So I think that's one thing on the health system side is thinking, how do we be, how can we improve our management to ensure that those who come to us, which is already a small fraction, but those who do come to us are able to get, get managed well so that they don't drive the stigmatization. Sure. The other part to that, I think, is in the broader sense of like the education of like epilepsy as a condition. In many places, there's still belief systems of epilepsy being contagious or epilepsy again, as I said earlier, being a mental health condition. And so some of that goes to some of the work our partners that I brought up are doing, which is really amazing, which is people who have epilepsy in these countries, being able to go out into the communities, especially those who have been you know, managed well, going out in the communities and sharing their story. And so this amazing Ugandan woman who runs Purple Bench goes out to these schools and you know, tells her story and talks to sort of these kids who also may have epilepsy or have had a seizure and destigmatizes it, you know, wraps her arm around that uh, around that child when other people don't want to interact with that kid to say that me touching them isn't going to cause any, you know, bad things. And so I think all of those kind of things like really help with that destigmatization. And then the healthcare providers in the country um, sort of getting on radio, getting on advertisements and talking like on World Epilepsy Day. I'm talking about it. All are things that have helped with destigmatization in the country, and I think are important facets um, to, you know, re the reduction of that stigma to help drive people to be able to actually come to buy medicine for care. Yeah. Well, it's clearly working. If you guys are treating 300 some odd patients a year so far in your first year or two, that's that's awesome. Well. Um, if we don't have any further questions, I guess we can wrap it up for this morning. Um, as I said before, we'll this is recorded and it'll be published on our um, WFNS YouTube channel. And um, we just really appreciate you being with us this morning, Dr. Fuller. Oh, yes. The chat says congratulations. Thank you so much for this morning. And um, we appreciate your, you taking the time to be with us. Definitely. Thank you again for inviting me. All right, everyone have a great morning. See you.